I don't know how much you think about communication or how we communicate with others, but we hardly say anything that conveys 100% brand new information. That is not how communication works. We are always assuming something on the part of our conversation partner. We speak, we teach, and we learn by analogy, simile, metaphor, by referring to something that's already known to teach something new, yet without needing to unpack what that thing is. We can, we can refer to it. So, for instance, Jim mentioned my wife. My wife and I can communicate via movie lines or TV show lines. As our kids are getting older and watching some of these movies and TV shows with us, I'm seeing the light bulbs coming on for them. They're realizing what a borrower, a borrower I am. They're realizing how unoriginal their dad is. Well, Hosea is a borrower. He is a preacher, proclaimer of the covenant, holding his contemporaries to the covenant fidelity agreed upon at Sinai, and he knows of the other biblical covenants and promises. Hosea's use of scripture demonstrates a redemptive historical perspective, a typological hermeneutic flowing from his own reading of the Torah. It's important to just stop for a moment, and Jim kind of already explained this, uh, and, I, and I agree wholeheartedly with him. What I mean by the word hermeneutic or hermeneutics, when I, when I use the word hermeneutic or hermeneutics, I'm fundamentally not talking about exegetical methodology. I'm talking about the biblical writer's perspective, their worldview, their presuppositions, right? How they come to the text. So we'll look at Hosea's use of scripture under three points. Hosea is a biblical theologian. The first is going to be, uh, there we go, Hosea's use of Deuteronomy. Hosea's redemptive historical perspective. The second will be Hosea's typological reading or proclamation of scripture. And then finally, we'll see Hosea and the covenants. So Hosea's use of Deuteronomy, Hosea's perspective, or his redemptive historical perspective. His perspective is thoroughly influenced by the book of Deuteronomy. They see the problem and the solution just the same way. You could say it like this, the heart of the problem is the heart of the problem. Just running through a couple of quick verses to kind of help us see, and I don't have them all on here, but just running through some quick verses to kind of hear the connections between Deuteronomy and Hosea. Just listen, Deuteronomy 6.5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So that's the call to interiority, this, this loving God from the heart. Deuteronomy 10.16, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Deuteronomy 11.16, Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Deuteronomy 29, 4. But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. And then Deuteronomy 31, 20. For when I, for when, for when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give to their fathers... And they have eaten, and they have grown uh, full and fat. They will turn to other gods and serve them and despise me and break my covenant. There's a sense in which the book of Deuteronomy is quite pessimistic about the future of Israel's life in the land. And Hosea describes their status just the same way. Hosea 5.4, their deeds do not permit them to return to the Lord. For the spirit of whoredom is within them, and they know not the Lord. Hosea 7.10, the pride of Israel testifies to his face, yet they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all of this. And then Hosea 11.7, my people are bent or hung up on turning away from me. Rather than turning to the Lord, it seems as though Hosea has invented a term describing their turning away from him. They are bent or hung up on turning away from me. And though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them. 
Now, Deuteronomy points out the problem, but it also points to the solution. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 25 through 31, and chapter 31 through 10 form something of an inclusio around the bulk of the book, promising a salvation to come through judgment. Really, it's a big gospel theme that courses through the scriptures. These very promises expose the problem. So when Moses is talking about the solution, right, it's going to come through judgment. And Hosea picks, on, picks up on just the same realities. So for Hosea, the problem and the solution, like Deuteronomy, is a salvation through judgment. By my count, Hosea has eight restoration promises, and five of those eight are influenced by the language from either Deuteronomy 4 or Deuteronomy 30 or both. So five of his eight promises of restoration uh, have the language of Deuteronomy 4 or Deuteronomy 30. So very, very telling where he's drawing his ideas. Now, let me just say something real quick in terms of eight restoration passages, um, because we'll look at a few of them. Um, For Hosea, for all the prophets, there's ultimately one salvation. So though he gives eight promises of restoration, these aren't eight different promises of restoration. They're they're eight different vignettes on the same promise. They're They're like facets of a diamond. Okay, It's one salvation, but each of the different vignettes describing the salvation to come is adding another little piece. And as you, as you bring them all together, you cumulatively see the, the greater glory of what God is going to accomplish. So first we're going to look at Hosea 3.5. Hosea 3.5 comes at the end of the first section of the book. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return. They will seek Yahweh their God and David their king. They will tremble to Yahweh and to his goodness in the latter days. And you can see, just, just comparing that to Deuteronomy 4, 29 through 30, that there is significant quotation going on. This is an especially important example for at least three reasons. First, like as I've mentioned, it's a quotation. Hosea is quoting from Deuteronomy 4, 29 through 30. There's a key addition to the material from Deuteronomy that points to Hosea's own intercanonical interpretation. So in Deuteronomy, the promise is that they would, that they would seek and that they re- would return to Yahweh their God. And do you see the addition that Hosea gives? They will return and seek Yahweh their God and David their king. This is evidence of he's not simply quoting Deuteronomy. He's interpreting the Torah. Now, I want, to, I want to read the whole passage just to put it in context. Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, Hosea 3, 1 through 5. And the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a leketh of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without effort or household gods. Afterward, so I don't know if you caught what verse 4 is doing. Verse 4 is talking about exile, right? Afterward, after exile, the children of Israel shall return and seek Yahweh their God and David their king. They shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Now, it's important to note that 
just as the final verse of this chapter quotes Deuteronomy 4, 29 through 30, so the first verse quotes Deuteronomy 31, 20. And this was one of the verses that I mentioned uh, at the very beginning of the, the talk, mentioning the pessimism of Moses, that it's not if they're going to rebel, it's when. And he's guaranteeing in, the, in Deuteronomy 31, 20 that they will rise up, that they will turn away after other gods. In fact, that verbal phrase only occurs in Deuteronomy 31.16, 31.20, and here in Hosea 31. So Hosea has described the call to marry Gomer, or the call to take her again to himself, using the language of Israel's certain apostasy. Verses 2 through 3 describe the redemption price. Verse 4 gives the reason for all of the Sinax. Again, Israel is going into exile. They will dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without effort or household gods. Yahweh is tearing his people away from the land which they, in which they have become Canaan, and he is putting them in exile. And again, 3.5 quotes Deuteronomy 29 through 30. The key is the addition of this returning from exile to the Lord and to David, their king. Second, they will do this. Let me go back to that. They will do this in the latter days. Now, this phrase, for, for the Hebrew speakers amongst us, ba'acharit hayamim, is a loaded phrase that occurs 13 or 14 times in the whole of the Old Testament, four times in the Torah, and in many of those cases, they're in, in very important places. So right before Jacob speaks about this king that's going to come to a, from the line of Judah, he gathers the children together and he says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the latter days. Before the third and fourth Balaam oracle, when... Um, when Balak is saying to Balaam, enough, enough, I called you to curse them and all you're doing is blessing, bl is blessing them, just, just, just get away. And he says, no, 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 before, before I, I leave, let me tell you what this people is going to do to your people in the latter days. And then goes on to give the fourth Balaam oracle where this king from the line of Judah is going to smash through the foreheads of Moab. So this is likely a helpful indicator pointing to why Hosea is linking not only the return from exile uh, in the latter days to Yahweh, but also that they're returning to Messiah, that they're returning to David. Because by this time, the historical David has been in the grave for quite some time. It is theologically as well as hermeneutically significant that Hosea picks up this promise presses it into the future for those going into exile from the northern kingdom and adds this aspect of returning not only to Yahweh, but to this future Davidite, great David's greater son, who will be the object of their latter-day returning along with the Lord. The next um, salvation oracle we'll look at is the final chapter of Hosea, Hosea 14. This is the climactic promise of salvation for the whole book. It follows a staggering description of judgment that can only be described as the death of the nation. In, in Hosea 13, 7 and following, it describes the Lord coming like a predatorial cat, like a lion against Israel in judgment, like a, like a leopard lurking along the way like a bear robbed of her cubs and tearing open their breast. This, along with other gripping imagery, is preceded by clear indicators that Israel has failed to heed two Deuteronomic warning passages. Judgment and exile seem imminent. The words of Hosea 14 are not to avert judgment. Okay, what I'm about to read is not Hosea saying, hey, look, if you'll turn back now, judgment won't come. No, what's been described in chapter 13 is death of the nation. So what comes now is best understood to be like a, 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 a 
penitent or, or a repentance liturgy that Hosea, on the promise of Deuteronomy 30 and Deuteronomy 4, is giving to the exiles because of God's promises to restore you from exile eventually, this is how you need to return to the Lord. This is how you need to come to him. So listen to Hosea 14, uh, 1 through 8. Return. It would probably help if I showed you my slide. I'm not the best at using PowerPoint. (coughs) Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words. Return to the Lord. Say to him, Take away all iniquity, accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, and we will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. And you, the orphan, finds mercy. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive and his fragrance like Lebanon. They shall return and dwell beneath his shadow. Uh, I tweaked the ESV there according to my own translation. They shall return and dwell beneath his shadow. They shall flourish like grain. They shall blossom like the vine. His fame shall be like the wine. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Now, Hosea 14, 1 through 8, is all about repentance and return, restoration. And it divides into two smaller units. Verses 1 through 3 is the prophetic call to repentance. You see that return, return. And verses 4 through 8 are the promise of God that they will return. It's interesting that critical scholars look at this chapter and they say this has to come from two different hands. Because the first three verses are talking about Their responsibility, repent, repent, repent. And these verses are talking about God's going to do it all. Uh, God's going to heal their meshuvah, their turning away. He's going to love them freely, enabling the return. I remember commenting on this in something that I've written. I was like, you know, Grace Emerson's problem is, 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 is not a source problem, but rather a theological problem and a failure to see that that this compatibilistic view of life threads through all of scripture, right? Where you have human responsibility, you have divine sovereignty, and they're not in contradiction to one another. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's he who's at work to will and, or, or, or work in, within you to will and to work for his good pleasure, right? You can put to a thousand different examples. But the first three verses are unquestionably a call. The prophet is saying, Go to the Lord on the basis of his promises and pray like this. You need to return to him, and this is how you're to return. And then verses 4 through 8 give the divine promise of healing, the divine enablement. So this passage is unified by this theme of repenting, returning, healing their inability to return. That's the structuring motif. The verb is theologically significant within the book of Hosea because back in Hosea 5.4, it's used to declare Israel's inability to repent. In 7.10 and 11.5, their unwillingness or refusal to repent, yet their need to repent in 6.1 and then here again, their need to return to the Lord in 14.2-3, together with what we saw in Hosea 3.5, the certainty that they will return. This leaves the reader in this compatibilistic tension. We need to return to the Lord, but we need the Lord to do it. So the verses 1 through 3 function as this this prayer liturgy. 
crafted for future exiles based on these promises. And the, and the way it relates is Deuteronomy 30 promises this return or has the same compatibilistic thing going on where there's the promise of heart circumcision, there's the promise that they will return, but it's also um, conditioned temporally on when you return, I will restore your fortunes. So both Hosea 14 and Deuteronomy 30 have the same thing going on. God absolutely needs to change these people from the inside out, and yet they also must return to him. There's no contradiction there. And this call to return is grounded in the compassion or mercy of the Lord. Because in you, the orphan is shown compassion. This picks up language from Deuteronomy 30 verse 3 that promises that he will have compassion. As well, Deuteronomy 4.31 grounds the promise of return from exile in the merciful character of God. This is, this is Deuteronomy 4.31 because the Lord your God is a compassionate God. Now, I want to pick up on something that Jim said in the previous talk about Moses interpreting Moses. It's exactly what's going on here. What's Moses doing? He's guaranteeing a return from exile because, because God is a compassionate God. The Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate. That's the exact same language Deuteronomy 4.31 guarantees a return from exile for future exiles grounded in the compassionate nature of God that Moses learned in Exodus 32 at the foot of the mountain after the Lord nearly obliterating his people. Not only are there thematic and lexical connections between these chapters, also structurally, I think Hosea 14 is dependent upon Deuteronomy 30. At the center of each of these pieces is God dealing with the problem, the promise in Hosea 14.4 to heal their apostasy and the promise in Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 that the Lord would circumcise their hearts. Again, Hosea and Moses have the same perspective. God is absolutely sovereign over the internal processes of mankind, and yet humanity is absolutely responsible to repent, return, and love the Lord. This paradox of divine redemption in no way precludes the necessity of Israel's repentance, since that must precede their restoration to the Lord and the land. Whereas Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 centers on Israel's future hope in the heart-circumcising work of the Lord, Hosea centers it similarly in the apostasy healing work of the Lord. Hosea 14.4, like later Jeremiah 31 through 34 and Ezekiel 36, they're all dependent upon Deuteronomy 30 and individually declare this glorious new covenant reality in their own way. For Jeremiah, it's the Lord writing the Torah on their hearts. For Ezekiel 36, it's the, the removal of their heart of stone, giving them a heart of flesh, sprinkling clean water on them, putting his spirit within them. For Hosea, it's Yahweh healing their turning away. Hosea 11.7, you are bent or hung up on turning away from me. I will heal. I will heal their turning away. Finally, Verses 5 through 8 ring out the promises of return and fruitfulness to the Lord and the land in language that's similar to Deuteronomy uh, 38 through 10. You see the, the language of fruitfulness. Hosea, 7, uh, Hosea 14, 7 guarantees a future return in metaphorical language of Israel as plant life. I can't go deep into it today for the sake of time, but while ambiguous, I think that verse 7 
is describing the promise of return from exile and the returnees coming to dwell under the shadow of Messiah. They shall return and dwell beneath his shadow. Uh, They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. His fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Uh, One of the earliest interpreters of the text, one of the Aramaic Targums, reads it this way. They will be gathered from among the exiles. They will dwell in the shadow of their Messiah. So I, I came to this conclusion before I saw that, you know, an, an early Jewish rabbi came to it years and years before I did. So what do we, what do we gain from looking at Hosea's use of Deuteronomy? His perspective, his whole orientation to life, his worldview has been profoundly influenced by Deuteronomy 4, 25 through 31, and 31 through 10. The Mosaic promises of restoration form the conceptual framework from which he operated. Hosea exhibits the same perspective as Moses in regard to the flow, direction, and progress of redemptive history. Number one, they both point to the inevitability of idolatry and sin. Second, they both speak of God's judgment culminating in their exile from the land, which picking up on the pattern that Jim has already talked about, we saw that pattern with Adam and Eve being exiled east of Eden. Third, the certainty of restoration, eschatological restoration to Yahweh from the exile. And one of the things that we've seen Hosea do is he makes clear that that return to Yahweh is ultimately a return to his Messiah. Hosea's perspective is redemptive historical. It's deuteronomic in his view of the unfolding of history under the sovereign hand of our God. Indeed, this also works its way out in a typological reading or proclamation of Israel's scripture. Point number two. So Hosea regularly uses simile or metaphor or allusion to Scripture to connect Israel of his day to some of the most egregious sinners in history. He's revealing connections, correspondence between a person, event, place, institution, in redemptive history. This is the stuff that typology is made of. To be sure, the theological underpinnings of a sovereign God providentially um, guiding history from creation to new creation is also a given. The first is Gibeah of Benjamin. Now, I don't know how versed you are in the Old Testament, the first 76% of your Bible, but I don't know if anything comes to mind when you hear Gibeah of Benjamin. Well, Hosea didn't have to say much. He said, they deeply corrupted themselves. This is uh, Hosea 9.9. This comes at the conclusion of a judgment oracle. He says, they have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. So there's the connection. He's comparing as in the days of Gibeah. Gibeah, Gibeah. What happened in Gibeah? Judges 19 happened in Gibeah. Does that ring a bell? The priest... And his concubine come to Gibeah of Benjamin. The men of the town have desire for sexual relations with the priest. His concubine, um, I'm sorry, uh, he puts his concubine out and they rape her and they kill her, dismembering her and delivering her body all throughout Israel as a call to arms. Judges 19 is a chapter that itself is masterfully crafted um, to sound like Genesis 19. It's kind of easy to remember. Judges 19, Genesis 19. Through characterization, the writer of Judges is describing the incident at Gibeah of Benjamin so that you can see this massively powerful reality that Israel has become Sodom and Gomorrah. 
So Hosea refers and makes this connection to Gibeah of Benjamin. You have deeply corrupted yourselves as in the days of Gibeah. He does it a second time in Hosea 10.9. The second reference connects Israel of Hosea's day with the arrogance of Gibeah of Benjamin, unwilling to give up the sinners among them and trusting in their military prowess, an action that nearly led to the obliteration of a whole tribe. In this judgment oracle, Hosea is taking the promise of judgment in the very same direction. Israel is trusting in the multitude of their mighty men, 1013, unwilling to repent, but they too would be destroyed in the end. The connection of Hosea's Israel to Gibeah of Benjamin comes by way of an analogy of behavior, okay? a behavioral pattern which exposes the idea of corporate personality, right? You, you, you've maybe heard somebody say, you are what you eat, but you, you are who you behave like. Right? Jesus says, you know, you're sons of your father, the devil, because you're liars, right? Uh, so he's connecting them to Gibeah of Benjamin. The next is Adma and Zebuim. <coughs> If Hosea's connecting of his contemporaries to Gibeah of Benjamin in Hosea 9 and 10 didn't effectively communicate the depth of their depravity, then Hosea 11, 8 through 9 drives the point home all the more clearly. Uh, This is a very powerful passage of, of, of God's own divine deliberation of the sinfulness of his people deserve obliteration. But but how can I give you up? This is this is the passage. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I give you up like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? Again, I don't know if you know Adma and Zeboim, but these are the other two cities destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. My heart is overturned within me. My compassions together grow warm. I will not carry out my burning anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again. That's important. I will not destroy Ephraim again. For I am God and not man. I am holy in your midst. I shall not enter into the city. In sum, these two verses communicate the heart of God for his people by way of copious allusions to Genesis 18 and 19. Like within these two verses, there's densely packed um, lexical links. And these verses effectively state that Israel has become Sodom and Gomorrah. For Hosea to say of the Lord, I will not destroy Ephraim again. In light of his destruction of the cities of of the plain in Genesis 19, is to link Ephraim directly with these cities. That is, he destroyed Ephraim the first time when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Admah and Zebuim. You see, they're one and the same. And then to say, I shall not enter into the city, recalls the narrative of Genesis 18 through 19, in which the Lord's angels entered into the city of Sodom, resulting in the destruction of the city. So, when the Lord destroyed the cities of the plain, he destroyed Ephraim, since they are morally one and the same as Sodom and Gomorrah. While he will judge them, and he says that in verses 5 through 7, and will exile them, he will not ultimately treat them as their sins deserve. They deserve to be obliterated like Sodom and Gomorrah. He won't because they're his son, who he's called out of Egypt. While he will judge, he will not utterly destroy. Shachat. And while he overturned the cities of Sodom, Hafach, and Adma and Zebuim, Hosea declares that it's Yahweh's very heart that is hafakt, that's overturned at the thought of judging Israel the way he judged Sodom and Gomorrah. By speaking of his contemporaries in this way, Hosea again subtly declares that Ephraim is Sodom and Gomorrah to the very core. And yet his covenant love for his people will not permit him to utterly destroy Jacob, 
Hosea alludes to or he quotes from the Isaac Toledoth, the Jacob narrative, multiple times throughout his prophecy. But nowhere quite so thoroughly as in Hosea 12. I'm going to have to summarize because this is detailed. In, in a masterful summary citation of the whole narrative, Hosea, th- Hosea 12, 3 through 6 utilizes language that evokes Jacob's heel grasping of Esau at birth, his wrestling with God on the Jabbok replete with his name change, his renewed relationship with Esau in returning to the land, reference to the Lord speaking to Jacob at Bethel, and a promised return from exile for Israel in line with Jacob's own promised return because God had promised Jacob when he fled Esau wanting to kill him that he would return. Actually, in very similar language that Moses uses to describe Israel's return. It's almost like Jacob's life foreshadows, typologically, of being a little bit silly. It does. Moreover, in the latter part of the chapter, Hosea 12, 13, uh, I'm sorry, 12, 12 through 13, he returns to the topic of the patriarch to, just, to speak of Jacob's flight to Aram for a wife in connection with Israel having been brought up from Egypt by a prophet, unstated but Moses. So at the very end of this chapter, Hosea is converging Jacob typology, Jacob's life as a type, with the Exodus as a type. So his fleeing into exile, which is a type of what's going to happen to his progeny, Jacob flees, Jacob becomes a people, Jacob is harshly treated, Jacob flees from his his, uh, persecutor, his persecutor flees after him in very similar ways in which You know, God deals with Egypt and Pharaoh. He deals with Laban. There's all kinds of connections. So his flight to exile, to to, to, to Aram, is connected with God bringing Israel up from Egypt in the Exodus. Hosea is using Jacob, I would say, as a complex type. Israel of Hosea's day is Jacob the deceiver to the very core. But they're nothing like Israel, their father who was converted on the Jabbok. And yet, the life of the patriarch typologically promises both condemnation for the current generation and a promised salvation through judgment to come for his future progeny. Jacob's life, exile, conversion, and change in exile and return to the land by God's grace becomes a pattern for their future redemption. Linking his flight with Israel's exodus under Moses later in the chapter heightens this salvation typology. It is Jacob typology converging with exodus typology by way of the typological nature of the lives of both Jacob and Moses. I don't have time to run through these things right now. I'm actually writing a a journal article on it right now of all the connections between Jacob and Moses. Just one will do. You know, Jacob is said in the passage to be fleeing to Aram. He's fleeing from Esau. He's baraking, fleeing from Esau who wants to harag him. He comes to a well, meets a woman, gets married. Go to Exodus 2. Moses baraks, flees from somebody who wants to harag him, kill him, also comes to a well, meets a woman, gets married. Now, this is just one of many connections, literarily, uh, that I think that Moses is making between Jacob and himself. All right, next is Canaan. In the same chapter... Hosea 12, 7 through 9 contains a bitingly ironic reversal of Leviticus 18 through 19. In particular, the command to love one's neighbor as oneself. The language and the themes powerfully connect with Leviticus 18 through 19. Where Moses commanded the people not to oppress their neighbor, that's Leviticus 19, 13, 
but rather to love their neighbor as themselves, 1918. And later in the chapter, he applies that also to the sojourner in verses 34 through 36. Dealing justly with one another by means of righteous scales. Hosea 12.7 can be translated, A Canaanite in whose hands are deceitful scales, he loves to oppress. With a masterful economy of words, the prophet declares his contemporaries' failure to heed the call of Leviticus 18 through 20, to love one's neighbor as oneself. By implementing deceitful scales instead of righteous scales, Hosea's contemporaries oppressed rather than loved their neighbors. Indeed, they did not simply oppress instead of love. Hosea says they love to oppress. Hosea's bitingly ironic rebuke reveals the depth of his contemporaries' depravity. Hosea's point is that Israel is Canaan. They are the Canaanites who possessed the land before them. Yahweh's words to his people through Moses were clear. He was vomiting the Canaanites out of the land because of their behavior. And if the Israelites took up their statutes and their instruction and lived like them, the same would happen to them. Hosea's words declare that they have behaved like the Canaanites, that they are in fact Canaan, and that they will be removed from the land. And in line with the movement of Leviticus 18 through 20, Hosea declares in 12.8, I am the Lord your God. From the land of Egypt, the prologue to the ten words. I will cause you to dwell in tents again as in the days of meeting. He's reversing the exodus and judgment. Exile is a reversal of the exodus. I'll talk about that in my next talk. Whereas Leviticus warns of vomiting the people of the land, Hosea declares a reversal of the exodus. Next, Adam. Hosea's pervasive treatment of his contemporaries by comparison to notorious sinners inside and outside of Israel certainly creates space for reading Hosea 6, 7 anew. But like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. The most natural reading of this passage in context and in light of Hosea's behavioral typology that we've already looked at is to see Hosea linking his contemporaries' transgression of the Mosaic Covenant to Adam's transgression of God's clear words of command in Genesis 1.28 and 2.17-18. In both cases, commandments were given to circumscribe the Lord's relationships with his people in both cases, the Lord's word is transgressed in rebellion. In so doing, Hosea connects Israel's sin, their rebellion, all the way back to the first sinner. Now, I've written more about that uh, in print uh, to, to make further arguments. So I'll leave that there for the sake of time. <laughs> We'll pick up the exodus as a pattern of redemption in the next talk. So just a concluding thought on this. The examples provided above illustrate how Hosea interprets the present in light of the past as well as the future by means of the past. Hosea links his contemporaries to some of the worst moments in Israel's history as well as to notor notorious sinners inside and outside of Israel. There is a sense in which this analogy of behavior, or you might say behavioral typology, can at times evidence intensification in terms of the evil, the, the extent to which Hosea seems to be saying his contemporaries have gone to or hit new heights in their sinning. They are Gibeah of Benjamin. They are Jacob before his conversion. They are the Canaanites who preceded them in the land. They are Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, they are like Adam himself. While Yahweh's indictment or accusation of his people by means of Israel's history uncovers the sinfulness of their sin, 
It also reveals the graciousness of his grace. They will be transformed and restored just like Jacob who returned. And also by means of a new exodus. Hosea's redemptive historical and typological use of scripture also reveals something of how he sees the covenants fitting together. So Hosea uses the word for covenant five times, but the reality is um, the word alone is not what conveys um, the reality of the covenant. There's other ways in which a writer can speak of something like covenants can be, re- be, 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 can be talked about scripturally without the word berit being used. So you can think of 2 Samuel 7, the quintessential passage on the Davidic covenant never mentions God's cutting a covenant. But very clearly, later passages talk about God cut a covenant with David. So just looking at the word covenant isn't uh, the way to get at Hosea's um, understanding of the covenant. So first of all, the Mosaic covenant. And I'm going to kind of just skip this because it's really clear he sees a Mosaic covenant. Um, his, his whole promise of redemption, uh, salvation to come through judgment, is standing on the book of Deuteronomy as a, as a covenant prosecutor. Okay, so the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. In Hosea 1.10, immediately after the, the, the threat and promise of the reversal of the covenant, name him... Lo on me, not my people, for I am, for you are not my people. And, and he's saying, you're not my people and I'm not ehye. I'm not I am to you, right? It's a very subtle way for Hosea to indicate the judgment of the covenant is broken. Uh, the, 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 the exodus is being reversed and they're marching backward into exile as a result of their covenant breaking. In the very next verse, Hosea writes, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. A clear quotation of Genesis 32. And and, and this passage goes on to talk about restoration. God gathering the sons of Israel and Judah together them appointing one head and coming up from the land. We'll talk about it more in the next talk. It's a clear promise of salvation through judgment and restoration. And it's being anchored in the Abrahamic promises. So a a key hermeneutical principle for Hosea is the priority of the Abrahamic covenant. The priority of the Abrahamic covenant presents a fundamental hermeneutical and theological axiom for Hosea. Hope beyond exile is based in the Abrahamic promises, not the broken Mosaic covenant. Second, the Davidic covenant. Reference to the Davidic covenant comes from two places. We've already seen in Hosea 3.5 the promise of return from exile and then returning and seeking Yahweh their God and David their king. This is a a messianic reading of God's promises to David in 2 Samuel 7, probably in light of uh, the Balaam oracles and um, Genesis 49 as well. But but right here in the same passage, this promise of salvation where he says, yet the number of the children of Israel should be like the sand on the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. Listen. And And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people... It shall be said to them, and the ESV translates it, children of the living God. This is a great example of where English translation obscures, I think, a really clear illusion. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, sons of the living God. Now that language, he doesn't say In the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said, you are my people. He's not just renewing the covenant formula, I will be your God and you will be my people. He's saying in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it will be said, sons of the living God. That language is a lot closer 
to what's called the adoption formula of the Davidic covenant. I will be a father to him and he will be my son. Now it's plural. So this could be an indicator that Hosea, like Isaiah 55 and other biblical writers, is already democratizing the Davidic covenant. So, so, so the status of the king is now the status of his people. The plot thickens a little more because this, this could give um, also a better idea for us when it goes on in verse 11. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together. They shall appoint for themselves one head and come up from the land. And there's always been this discussion, this debate, who's this one head figure? Well, we've already seen in Hosea 3, 5, the promise of salvation to come through judgment, this restoration from exile would be a returning and seeking Yahweh their God and David their king. Well, this language of sons of the living God and this enigmatic one head figure who the exiles are going to be gathered to and are going to be led up from the land by, this one head figure is clearly, well, I say clearly, I think, you don't want to overstate your case, great David's greater son. Messiah. So if I'm right that the one head refers to a future Davidic king and sons of the living God pointing to a democratization of the Davidic promise within a future work of grace, then Hosea would seem to be showing us, like later biblical writers do, I think of Psalm 72, 17, Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 33, that Yahweh's promises to Abraham are ultimately being fulfilled through a future Davidic son. Right? We're seeing Hosea isn't just a quoter and a user of Scripture. He's an interpreter. He's reading Scripture in light of Scripture. He's wrestling with Scripture. Hosea knows of a new covenant. We'll look at that in the next talk. Hosea chapter 2 speaks of that in the language of Genesis 1.30. I believe that this also points to him knowing something of a covenant with creation or a covenant with Adam. Hosea twice uses Genesis 1 language in the context of covenant. So in the promise of a new covenant in chapter 2 verse 20, he talks about God making a covenant with all the realms of the animals from creation, Genesis 1.30. Uh, in Hosea 4, 3, he describes judgment because of covenant breaking as a reversal of creation, where he actually takes the order of the animals and inverts them, indicating that judgment because of covenant infidelity would actually be a reversal of creation. And speaking of him just reading scripture, where, where would Hosea come up with that idea that judgment is a reversal of creation. Genesis 6 through 9, perhaps. I'm having to fly over a few things here. Let me, let me summarize what I think is Hosea's view of the covenants. First, Hosea clearly voices the built-in obsolescence of the Mosaic covenant. Hope beyond exile is not found there. Second, Hosea declares the priority of the Abrahamic covenant as it relates to the Mosaic covenant. Hope beyond exile is found there. Third, the tight connection between covenant and creation in two key covenantal passages provides credibility for reading Hosea 6-7 as referring to a previous covenant with creation and Adam. Fourth and finally, Hosea declares uh, the certainty of a new covenant that will culminate in a new creation. Growing organically from Yahweh's covenant with creation at Abraham and David. Hence the new covenant focuses on the flourishing of the Abrahamic promises and a future David, Messiah, to whom Yahweh's people will return in obedience. So my conclusion on Hosea's hermeneutics is this. Hosea's perspective can be described as redemptive historical or covenantal. 
He views the God of Israel as the one and only sovereign, superintending, guiding, or directing all of human history toward its ultimate resolution in a king from the line of David. This theological given of the sovereignty of God explains why he finds so many connections, correspondence between his contemporaries and earlier people, places, events, and institutions. The way he unites or conflates his generation with prior generations and particular individuals reveals the principle of corporate personality or corporate solidarity. The idea of one standing for the many so that he calls his contemporaries, you're like Jacob, right? That, that implies this, this idea of corporate representation. Hosea's Israel is like the Exodus generation with the golden calf. More on that in the next talk. And Jacob before his conversion on the Javik resulting in judgment. And yet God's glorious salvation to come through judgment will be built off the redemptive patterns discovered in reflecting on the life of the nation in the Exodus and the patriarch Jacob himself. Resulting in ultimate salvation, new covenant, and new creation. Thank you.